fingernails were never dirty. I mean, we were slick. McGonagall, uh, he, was, he was a terrific person. We always, on Sunday, had a cookout on a fan tail of the ship. Being aboard the ship was really something. It was fun, like going from Abidjan Ivory Coast all the way down to Cape Town. You're drifting along at three knots and listening 10 miles off the coast. When the Liberty pulled into Abidjan, that was a social event of the year. I got back aboard at 2 o'clock in the morning the day we left. <laughs> met at the gangway by Captain McGonagall who informed me that we had orders to get underway immediately and I was to get the rest of the troops and we were getting underway. In a sudden change of mission, the ship was ordered to head for the Middle East. Five thousand miles away in Washington, Israel's hardline spy master, Mayor Amit, was making a secret visit to his friends in the CIA and the Pentagon. Amit's key meeting was with Robert McNamara, the U.S. Secretary of Defense. Amit wanted to know whether the Americans would back Israel if it struck the first blow. But the two men have very different memories of their encounter. Yeah, I told him, look, we don't want even one soldier from you. All what we want from you to stop the Russian coming into the, into the arena and number two, to uh, help us after the war. So when I finished, he asked me two questions. One, how long it will take? I said one week. How many casualties? I told him less than the War of Independence. So I asked him, uh, Mr. Secretary, what do you advise to me? Can, uh, can I go home now or stay here until things will clear up? He said, no, you go home, your place is there now. I drew the conclusion that it was a green light. Absolutely not. Because at that point, uh, President Johnson and I and Dean Rusk had fully agreed that we must keep the U.S. in a position where if Israel called on us for military assistance to turn back the attack by, by Egypt and possibly turn back an attack uh, by Egypt with the support of the Soviet Union, we had to be in a position that we could obtain the support of the American people and the Congress for applying military force in support of Israel. And we would not have that support if Israel had attacked Egypt. So our position was, no, don't initiate the attack. And I have no basis for believing that uh, the Israelis you spoke of received any other indication from me than that. That same night, a young NSA linguist named Alan Blue was suddenly dispatched to join the Liberty. He uh, was called in the middle of the night, around 2 o'clock in the morning. And he left the, left the house, he went to NSA, and at noon the next day, he was on a plane to Rota, Spain. I'd never seen him that way. He was almost teary. Um, he clung to me like he didn't when he had uh, taken um, prior trips. Alan Blue met the ship at the Spanish port of Rota. By now, the crew had been told they were heading for the Gaza Strip. We knew that from the daily news that the Arab-Israeli situation was getting more and more hostile. Uh, that so far there was no war, uh, but it looked to anybody who read the newspapers that there would soon be a war, and so we were sent out there, obviously, to listen to what was going on. Early on the morning of Monday, the 5th of June, Israel went to war. Its planes pounded airfields in Sinai and the Suez Canal Zone, destroying most of Egypt's air force. These are the original shots taken by the gun cameras during the attacks on the Arab airfields.
the fact is that they didn't have a clue when we came on. They were completely caught by surprise. They were having breakfast, or immediately after breakfast, and coffee, and boof, up we came on nine airfields. Two in the Sinai, five in, in, in Egypt, and two in Upper Egypt. And then we had the second round, and the third round, and the fourth round. Once again, the actual aerial combat shots taken by the Israeli gun cameras. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was boosting its military presence near the war zone. It moved 20 warships into the eastern Mediterranean. In response, the Pentagon ordered the 6th Fleet to keep all aircraft and ships at least 100 miles away from the coast. But one vessel received no such message. The USS Liberty steamed on towards the Sinai coast. We were told there was no need to worry. We had asked Commander Sixth Fleet for a, a, an armed guard to go along with us, a destroyer. He sent the message back saying we were in, in international waters, flying the American ensign, there was no need for a, an armed escort. The Liberty was approaching a scene of total Israeli victory. On the third day of the war, they'd taken the West Bank. But the big prize was the capture of Jerusalem's old city. I was elated when I heard it. Jerusalem, every Jew prays, I think, every day next year in Jerusalem. That evening, the Liberty arrived at her destination, off the Sinai coast. Thursday, the 8th of June, dawned fine and clear. But the war was still raging, and Israeli planes flew out from the Sinai Peninsula to check on the Liberty. Reveille was at six. Um, you got up, you showered and everything, and, and you go uh, for uh, a chow. But before that, we had heard that, like at five in the morning, or around that time, that the planes were buzzing us. The Israeli aircraft seemed to be identifying the ship as belonging to their ally, America. There were about nine different occasions that airplanes came out, and probably 12 times that were circled, 12 separate orbits of the, of the ship during the morning. Lloyd Painter relieved Ennis as officer of the deck. He too was reassured by the presence of the Israeli planes. I remember vividly looking out through the portholes, looking down on the O-1 level, and seeing all the officers sunbathing. And at the same time, we were being overflown, and I remember feeling very good and very warm inside that we were safe. They knew who we were. We were not a stranger out there that day. Confident that the Israelis knew who they were, the Liberty men relaxed. A new flag was flying, visibility was perfect, and they'd received no orders to leave the area. That sense of security was about to be brutally shattered. At two o'clock in the afternoon, the officers on the bridge spotted three Delta Wing Mirage jets. I saw them come at us. In fact, I was looking through the porthole when the jets came down at, 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 and leveled off on us at attack attitude. To my surprise, uh, there were red flashes under the wings and uh, missiles, rockets started hitting the ship. But the portholes were blown out instantly. Mine in my chest, the fellow next to me uh, got it in his face. And we, we all went down on the deck with the force of the concussion from the uh, glass. The next thing I heard down in my space was a panicky announcement on the loudspeaker 1MC. General Quarters, General Quarters, this is no drill. General Quarters, ship is under attack. And you hear ping, 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 ping. The decks above were being shredded. The attempts to send an SOS message failed. The Liberty's frequencies were being jammed. You'd have to know what frequencies we were going to come up 